Awesome. Hello, everyone. Welcome after the break. We hope you had an awesome dinner and you are ready for more speeches. Uh, we are so happy to host Lana Polanski, uh, who is a Montreal-based writer, critic, game designer, and professional scholar. She enjoys Marxist dialectic and strong coffee, and she will talk about the art games. So give a warm welcome to Lana Polanski. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking about the history of art games as a fundamental central part of the history of game design. Not fringe, not marginal, but actually central to games as a medium. Um, so I've been working in games for about six years. Um, you heard my bio. I was going to give it, but they did it for me. <laughs> um, and this is kind of something that I have been focusing on a little bit more recently, that something that's been bothering me since I started, but as I started to, because I'm kind of a weird seeker, if you can't tell, um, and so I, I look for games that are a little bit off the beaten path, and what I started to notice was that the more that I dug into history and the history of avant-garde games, I started to notice that, wow, there's a lot of this stuff, and in fact, at some point in history, from the perspective of, you know, published games that were invested by, in by publishers that were on consoles, that were on home computers, there's actually more of them from the 80s and 90s than there are today. Um, so something that keeps us um, from acknowledging this history, that kind of obscures it, is that the history of video games has evolved with a narrative of certain tech progressivist tendencies and, and um, viewing games as a, a business of entertainment. Um, rather than as uh, an art form unto themselves. Um, even when we talked about them as art forms, or, you know, are games really art, it's still often within this perspective of, yeah, but they're growing up within this highly commodified industry, um, which values iteration, principles of, you know, human-computer interface, and a formula that's reproducible and lucrative, rather than art philosophy or conceptualism or aesthetics or anything like that. The word art games, um, well, the games that I'm going to be talking about, they existed before art games was really a term. But they have always existed under different names. Right now, you might call them alt games. Um, in the early 2000s, you might call them scratchware games. A lot of these games now from the 80s and 90s are often called abandonware. Um, you can call them experimental games. They go by many, many names. Um, all that really helps us do is situate them within history, but it doesn't really tell us anything about them. Um, and hopefully I can kind of put that historical context back into perspective by doing that here. So um, the title of my slide comes from this, this tweet from developer JP Lackey, which, you know, art games are basically as old as games. So he was responding to developer Robert Yang. I don't know if you know that guy, but he's cool. He makes a lot of like really queer games. He was talking about this, um, this piece on Mark Tribe's site, who's a curator, and he was talking about this Massachusetts um, Museum of Contemporary Art exhibition in 2001, where it was like all art games, or rather, game art, for which there is a distinction. John Sharp, who wrote um, this book uh, called Works of Game, is this art historian, and he draws this distinction between art games and game art, where art games are games that are made to be games, but also to be expressive and thoughtful and effective and yada yada. Game art is stuff that's meant to be installation art or conceptual pieces or multimedia art using games as a raw material the same way somebody might use paint or household appliances or whatever. The thing is though, the more you dig into this history of play and aesthetics, the more you find that often game developers were divulging or, or indulging rather in conceptual art and you find that a lot of artists were also indulging in game design. So the distinction is a little bit fluid. Um, but what I really want to get to is because this distinction is so fluid and there is this traceable history between the two and they're always interacting, games that have been deliberately designed as intimate works of art have existed since before 2008. Indie games didn't start in 2008. 
They have existed for a long, long time. And the whole phenomenon of the indie darling and the indie rock star is only allowed to persist because of this ahistoricity we have when it comes to conceptual art and expressive games and avant-garde games. So what you end up with is instead of an engagement with the works as they actually exist, you have this conflation of le legitimacy with auteur theory and rock starism. Rather, instead of looking at games as art which can be dissected and engaged with, you look for boy geniuses, let's say, which give the medium a kind of legitimacy. As if to say, here is our canon, now we are really art. So, this is a little bit arbitrary. I'm choosing this brief, really, really truncated history of video games um, between 1985 and 95. It should be noted, however, that two of the games that I'm going to be talking about exist kind of outside of the spectrum. The first, um, actually the second, is from 1984, and this, the last one is from 1998, which is to say that this is not, like, there's no, like, split, like, 1985 to 95, and then art stopped. Um, it's just that this is sort of a helpful guideline of about, say, 10 to 15 years, where the industry was highly unstable. Um, but there was also a lot of creation going on at the same time. So you're all probably familiar with the 1983 crash in which Atari controlled like 80% of the video game market worldwide. And um, when they, they fell from grace, it took about, pretty much it took down the entire Western industry with them. And um, I'm sure you're also all aware of the um, excavation of the video games. This is a, a still actually from the E.T. video game, <laughs> that terrible video game. Um, uh, the, and those games were excavated but, uh, with a bunch of other games too um, out of Alamogordo, New Mexico. So uh, the, at the New Yorker, Ted Troutman was writing about this and he, he uh, pretty much summed up exactly what had perspired. <laughs> perspired, <laughs> exactly what had happened um, between this period up to now in terms of the industry becoming hyper commodified and hyper sort of calcified around certain franchises. So he says, today's console makers have settled into a predictable rhythm, typically releasing new machines every five or six years, enough time for customers to trust that a next generation system will be genuinely superior to the one it replaced. In the early 80s, the process was far less orderly. Manufacturers issued new systems much more frequently, and their newness often hinged on gimmickry such as built-in screen or a different kind of controller, rather than major technical milestones. So it was just like a wild west of really, really silly <coughs> gimmicks and hardware that was really specific to certain consoles and games. Um, of course, this didn't quite last. Um, Japan is actually widely credited with having saved the game industry, especially with the arrival of the Famicom um, in 1985 and later on with Sega. Um, and, and also arcade culture um, was and continues to be extremely, extremely strong in Japan, which is something else that kind of, but it, let's say this, it was a powerful aspect of the games industry, but arcade culture is also sort of, um, it's like an omen a little bit of what was to come with the, the bigger industry later on um, as uh, the industry migrated back to the West from Japan. So the arcade industry, that culture was also very, very calcified around certain predictable formulas and routines. Um, there was some really, really cool experimentation that went on, but most of it was ex aesthetic and very, very rarely formal. Um, nonetheless, we have arcade culture, we have the Famicom, we have DOS games, we have BBS door games, which are like really early indie games. We have the CD-ROM. All of these conspired to create a, a really interesting period in the video game industry. So, I mentioned that um, uh, Mass Maka exhibition. This is a game from that exhibition. It's called Jody. It is a collaborative uh, collaboration between Joan Heemskirk and Dirk Peismans. SOD is a first-person shooter style game created on top of the Castle Wolfenstein gaming engine. It uses a stark geometry of black and white polygons, where other commercial games typically used vivid color and intri intricate backgrounds. The challenge of this game is negotiating the elements of a crudely rendered virtual world where objects are difficult to recognize. That's Mark Trod, the curator, talking about it. 
The thing with Jody, I mean, this is a game made by artists for other artists to be in a, a, a gallery space. But doesn't it kind of sound like a lot of indie games in terms of like negotiating yourself in space, <laughs> in terms of using space as a, a thematic and conceptual structure? I mean, this line between art games and game art, it, it's not that strong when you actually start to break down some of the assumptions that are built into something like Jody. In fact, I would go so far to argue that the line between art and games is, has a much longer pedigree in history than we tend to expect. This is not even, this is scratching the surface, by the way. So this is Ligia Clark. She was a Brazilian, it's called neo-concrete art. She was a neo-concretist, and she did these installation pieces that were participatory pieces. This one in particular is called Nostalgia of the Body, and it's part of a series. And basically what it is, it's part like participatory theater, part conceptual art, where there would be usually some kind of textured object, and the way that it would kind of go down is you would have these people who were playing certain roles, so somebody would be the person who gets covered in the object or is covered in the object, and then other people have to come take it off. And it was like this really weird uh, ritualistic experience. She often described her art as ritualistic, and it was meant to be very, very therapeutic. She was really big into <coughs> art therapy. And it was a way of pe for people to kind of um, break down their inhibitions and start to kind of question, interrogate their own assumptions about being in spaces with other people. So this is a way of using play to interrogate the self and the human condition and all that. That's been going on for a long time. I would go so far as to say it's been going on since the 1920s at least with uh, the Surrealists and their parlor game um, exquisite corpse. Um, computer art goes back to at least the 1950s, so there's a huge history for this. Um, so there is this really big conceptual art con uh, connection and this really big modernist art connection with video games. Um, but what we see is a hyper solidification of the market, inability to reconcile works like this into video games, um, an inability to recognize the philosophical, ideological uh, relationships between video games as we understand them now and pieces like this and how much <laughs> things like this have helped us to understand how we can use virtual interactive spaces to better understand ourselves. Um, so I would even go as far to say that because it's so hard to publish a or justify funding for a risky game now, um, what, you, what we've ended up with Instead of the hot bed of Wild West creation with like game gloves and Rob the Robot and all those kinds of things, what we have now is kind of an oligopoly that operates like a cartel and basically gets to dictate the market. And it leads to really interesting assumptions and claims, <coughs> like this one from my friend Chad. <laughs> so I made a little bit of a joke a little while ago where, I mean, I, can, I can't even count the number of times that somebody has said to me, oh, I wish like X game about X thing exists. And like nine times out of 10, I'm like, yeah, it, it does exist. You just have never heard of it because it gets no press. And my friend Chad here, who may be a bot, I'm not entirely sure, <laughs> says, try presenting that to the publisher at your next game pitch as if I have a job. <laughs> Isn't that cute? So <laughs> the more I read this, I think to myself, maybe he's, Maybe he's being ironic, like maybe he's joking, but then again, maybe he's not. And I'm not just trying to dunk on Chad here, which is why like, I hit his act, like don't bother Chad, leave Chad alone. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I want to point out to this because I think in some way we're all Chad. <laughs> There's a little Chad in all of us because <laughs> Chad is this guy who has no other options but to rely on the apparatus of the market and he can only see things in terms of those institutions and what they can give them, him in terms of power and legitimacy. And I think we have a tendency to do that when we indulge in the kind of auteur theory that I'm talking about, especially when we start talking about the indie darlings. Um, so it's, we end up with this alt history that it's kind of hidden, it's kind of obscured, there's no because there's no profit motive to really curate old weird games, there's no incentive to actually archive or curate them for major companies, so we can't actually rely on them. But I wanted to point out a few really important examples from our past that I think we could bring back into the central fold of understanding games as art. 
So here is Teresa Duncan. Teresa Duncan. This is Teresa Duncan here. And right there was her boyfriend of 12 years, Jeremy Blake. Um, both of them were very, very successful media artists. Um, and pretty much, I mean, it's a really kind of sad story. I don't want to dwell on it too much. But unfortunately, she passed away at the age of 40. Um, she took her own life, and later on, a few months later, Blake also took his own life. And it's, it's the subject of a lot of conspiracy theories because they were opponents of Scientology. Beck is involved. It's, it's a very weird story. Um, but I don't want to dwell on it because her life and her works have been the subject of a lot of sensationalism, even at the head of her own ascendancy as a game developer and as an artist. She was branded as, you know, Silicon Valley's it girl. And multiple articles would, you know, make comments about her clothing as if it mattered, you know. So, and, and the games that she did make, Chop Suey, Smarty, and Zero Zero, three, before leaving, mostly to become a filmmaker and blogger, um, they were labeled as girl games during a period where the industry was trying to tap into the girl market, which is to say, like, Barbie games and shit. But she bucked the trend, because she was a really good writer that she brought a lot of nuance and compassion to her writing. And really, the only reason that her games are considered girl games is that she was a woman, her games are about women, and you don't kill anybody. That's all. So I want to focus on <coughs> Chop Suey especially, um, because I think it's a really, really good example of the power of her work. So here's a still from Chop Suey. Um, this is a really interesting game. It's about these two teenage girls, uh, Lynn and Junebug, and their Aunt Vera, right here, and her husband, her third husband, Bob. Her second husband was Bob. Also, her first husband was Bob. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of impish humor in this game. There's a lot of, you know, tongue-in-cheekness. It's a very exploratory, open-ended game. There's no real beginning, middle, or end, and it's just about these two girls hanging out with their aunt for a day. And these, the way that it's set up, it, it takes place in this really, really small town called Cortland in Ohio. Um, apropos of this, uh, Duncan also grew up in a really, really small town called Lapeer in Michigan. So she may be writing from experience here in terms of talking about, you know, the need for imagination and escapism in a place that boring. <laughs> Um, the uh, childhood fantasies of adult freedoms, especially with somebody like Aunt Vera, who seems to have whirlwind adventures all the time and do whatever she likes. Um, and, and also because it is an edutainment game, which is part of why it was so marginalized, um, there is a lot of these themes of like using imagination as really implicitly important in actually learning things. So, you know, you do these things, you, you meet people in the town, you solve these learning puzzles, and then you can go back over them and do them over again. And the reason for this is, it's not because you're going to find anything much new in the way of actual objects of things to do in the game, but there's a lot of subtext in the game. And I think the reason things repeat the way that they do is because every single time you recollect a new experience from the game, you understand something new about the characters. So Aunt Vera here is this fun-loving woman. But the more you look at her and the more you read about her, you realize like she's holding a drink with her third husband, Bob. She has a drinking problem. And she's maybe not the best with relationships. So there's a darkness and a sadness in the game that it hides with this kind of impish, pastiche veneer, really, really um, colorful, pastel, hand-drawn style by Monica Lynn Jesue. Yes, that's her name. And there's, so there's a lot of... Uh, playfulness there, but there's also a lot of messiness and danger and chaos underneath it. So there's a lot of family drama underneath that. Um, and so I didn't get a chance to read that quote before from uh, Teresa Duncan, but basically she compared it to Alice in Wonderland in the way that it's very fragmented, very disjointed, and very kind of magical realist. But it's ultimately the story about, you know, it's a coming of age story about a teenage girl. And you can read it in any order and you can still pick that up. And that's what she was trying to do. And this is the game that made her basically um, an art games rock star. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear to have lasted. And the only thing she's really known for now is having died. <laughs>
in a magnificent fashion. Um, I think part of it is because they're girl games. Part of it is because it's an entertainment game. And part of it is just because there's a lot about, you know, this era of games, computer games in particular, which don't really fit into our understanding of, you know, cutting edge technology. So there's a lot of stuff holding that, that exists as, as sort of unfair attitude barriers that hold her back from being held up as a particularly important voice in video game design. Um, the only way to get a hold of these games now really is Rhizome, the digital arts magazine, um, with collaboration with Jen Frank, the critic, has actually um, digitally archived the games on their website. And if you go to their website, you can play them in the browser, all three of them. So that's really awesome, and you should do that. Um, moving on, so that was 1995. But now we're gonna go way back. Um, so Mel Croucher, an automata. This is a guy who was an architect prior to becoming a game designer. Unlike Teresa Duncan, who was very much situated in the art world, this is a guy who very much left the art world to become, he very much just wanted to make <coughs> games. Um, and he formed this company called Automatic UK in 1977 in Portsmouth. And he's often credited with having basically founded the British game industry. Um, so he, his uh, buddy who helped work on a bunch of the games, Christian Penfold, um, are the best known figures from this period. Penfold is mostly known because he doffed the character of Pyman, who was sort of a mascot for the company and had his own game. But the people in the photo are Croucher, Penfold, Robin Evans, who was an artist, and Andrew Stagg, who I think was a programmer. Um, and most of the games that they released were really, really tongue-in-cheek. Um, mostly plays off of existing kind of pop culture references or existing games, like Auto Monopoly, which is a Monopoly game. Or uh, they have one called My Name is Uncle Groucho, You and a Fat Cigar, <laughs> which is really kind of weird and surreal. And they were really committed to non-violent games. Like their slogan was, our games don't bleed. Um, they had one last game called, in 1984, called Deus Ex Machina. And it cost them so much to make this game that they pretty much broke even. And after it was released, they sold the company to a dentist for 10 pence and moved on from the game industry. The way that the industry worked, uh, well, at least their company, was it was mostly mail order and they were charging wholesalers the same as individual customers. Um, and they really abhorred the idea of middlemen in the industry, so publishers, retailers, distributors. Uh, even today, this was in 2013, and Mel Croucher was just castigating the modern industry for failing to actually invest in experimental games. So he says here, like, back in the 70s, and certainly by the time we hit the 80s, I thought I'd be making interactive stories, uh, doing full stories. I thought I'd be generating emotion. I'm amazed that big studios haven't invested in this. I can't believe it's still people shooting each other and jumping up and down. It's crap. So... There was this period where really anything was possible and people were trying new things. And as things sort of kind of coagulated around the oligopoly we have, that uh, basically around a third party, an intermediary like he's talking about, those interests were, were what predominated and not interests like this. Thankfully, um, Croucher was able to reopen uh, Automata as Automata Source in 2012 but they mostly do consultancy stuff. And they made a sequel, which was kickstarted. The only reason they were able to, because they had this, this big cult following, um, where they made a sequel to Deus Ex Machina, um, which starred Christopher Lee, of all people. Um, also, and this is totally like an aside, but if you go to automata.uk today, <laughs> it's a cabaret mechanical puppet site, like, like marionettes which is really terrifying to look at, but very, very apropos for the kinds of games that this guy actually made. So let's take a look at Deus Ex Machina. So this is a still from the game, which tells you a little bit about it, doesn't it? It was released for the ZX Spectrum in 1984 for 15 pounds or about $22, which is a lot of money for the time. And it was on two tapes with, a, the, the first slide that I had, that really incredible expressionist woman's face, that was the cover of the game. Um, it fell victim to an awful lot of piracy, like a lot of piracy. Um, but perhaps it says something about Mel Croucher that when later on, like in the late 2000s, 2010s, <laughs> when he was trying to get his company back together, he recruited one of the ex 
teen hackers who prolifer proliferated his game on the internet. Um, so it wasn't so much that he blamed the piracy of the game for its commercial failure, so to speak. It was a critical darling, but commercially didn't do so great. But also just because of the nature of the industry and because it was really expensive to make. Um, it starred the voice talents of Ian Dury, the punk icon, John Pertwee of Doctor Who, and Donna Bailey and Frankie Howard, um, who were two other British acting icons. Um, and it was originally meant to be played off so th there was a tape for the game that you put in the ZX Spectrum, and then there was a separate audio tape, which had all the dialogue and all the music on it. Um, and what you had to do was listen to the tape and then sync them up, which there was like a countdown. It's a pain in the ass, actually. Um, so today, all that stuff has been digitized mostly by fans. So if you just want to get like an emulator and then download the MP3, you can just do that. Um, so it tells this sci-fi, this kind of sci-fi narrative about this, this baby is called the defect and he's built in a machine. Um, he's made out of the DNA from a, a mouse dropping and he's built in this big incubator. And it deals with the life cycle, the birth, life and death of this defect um, according to, it's, it's structured after Shakespeare's Seven Ages of Man from As You Like It. Um, and so it mixes a lot of Shakespearean prose in with like sci-fi tropes. Like it'll have like a couplet and then it'll transpose the word laser for something else. Um, and so a few things stand out about it. The first is of course it's use of abstraction. Like abstraction was really, really common to see in video games at this time because of technical limitations. But what these guys did, they didn't just use it for reference or representation. Um, they were also using it to evoke specific ideas. Um, and so you see a lot of like specialized wording or imagery in certain places, a lot of surrealism, a lot of suprematism or kind of geometric abstractions to imply certain things. Um, there's a score, degree of ideal ent entity. It doesn't matter. It's just there for show. Because you're gonna die anyway. <laughs> um, that's, it's, there's a deeply dark kind of existential bent in the game where no matter what you do, you're still playing out this life, good and bad, and it's always going to run down to zero no matter what. The game sort of, in its sort of poetry prose way, if you're listening to the audio, it tells you how to play the game. It'll have certain refrains, like um, follow the pattern touching the light is one of the refrains, and it just, it's literally telling you how to play the game. And then you have to follow the pattern as best you can, you get a better score. But really you're just sort of kind of witnessing this interactive movie. Um, and it's a really good example of a game as a total work of art. The audio tape and the videotape separate from each other are utterly meaningless. Once they're together, it becomes this really engrossing experience. And so it sort of breaks down the um, idea that you can have a perfect formula to make a perfect game and that the details like video and audio and music don't matter and are just window dressing. They're, they are central to how this game functions and makes sense. Um, and so that's, that's Mel Croucher's way of doing things and thankfully he's back in our lives. I want to move on to somebody else who is a lot more elusive and who doesn't seem to be so elusive that, um, there he goes. <laughs> um, so this is Osamu Sato and I'm gonna also talk about his company outside. He studied at the Kyoto Institute of Technology and worked at a firm called Moss Advertising before creating his own freelance firm, Osamu Sato Design Office. There he worked on installations and multimedia pieces and actually got a, a few exhibition showings in Tokyo um, in the 90s. Eventually he moved on to founding his own development studio outside, which much like Teresa Duncan, he released three games and pieced. Um, two of those were Eastern Mind and Chu Tang in the early 90s, and then in 1998, LSD Dream Emulator, which is probably his best known work. The image I took of him, because it's so hard to find pictures of this guy. Um, this is a still from uh, Eastern Mind. He doesn't really have eyeballs in his face, but he's, in that game, um, his head is used to represent the island of uh, uh, Tong No. That's the name of the island. Um, his, and like different orifices on his face and like parts of his head represent different parts of the island and it's like an overhead map. It's really weird. <laughs> really good though. Um, and so 
he was known for like really hyper colorful either 3D or pre-rendered 3D games. Uh, often very exploratory, open-ended, and highly existential and highly spiritual in terms of their undertones. Um, Outside is actually still in business, um, but mostly as an art studio. Sato and his team at Outside, for all intents and purposes, have actually left the game industry, as I said. And it seems largely out of disappointment, again, with how the Japanese industry has moved and has evolved. Um, he seems to be really bored with games. He, he was much like Teresa Duncan in that he was an artist first, and games were a raw material for him. And um, he just couldn't keep operating in an industry that expected him to make like soccer and fighting games. Um, as I said, he's very elusive. He didn't have Twitter until like 2009. Um, and he appears to have really, like there's no interest whatsoever in terms of the cult fandom either in the West or in the East. Um, and he mostly does photography and painting and music now and he has a discography you can download. However, his fandom is very energized and it's only because of them that I've been able to play his games at all. Um, Sony appears to have no interest in either localizing or re-releasing any of his games, making them accessible. So it's pretty much been on the part of fans to localize games into other languages um, and to digitally archive them and make them downloadable. Um, so now I want to focus on his, his most well-known game, LSD Dream Emulator. So this was released in 1998 for PlayStation. Um, it's his first truly rendered 3D game. Um, and it's, it's based on an actual dream journal by this guy, this artist Hiroko Nishikawa, who is an artist at uh, Asmic Ace Entertainment. And he'd been keeping this dream journal for like a decade. And there's actually a scan of it online that you can read. Um, and basically, he just wrote down like his weird ass <coughs> dreams and like made art to accompany them. Um, and I, I think in the original um, sleeve of, for the game, you could actually get a copy of the book. So what this game does, I think it's based on the way that, that uh, Sato describes it, he was looking at a demo for the PlayStation, and I think there was a graphical glitch, and he was inspired at that point to make a game that's like walking through a graphical glitch, um, where you have all of these, like, it's uh, really weird, like, imagery, a lot of surreal imagery that often repeats, but it has no internal meaning. You have to kind of derive the meaning for yourself. You can keep playing it basically forever and keep generating new dreams. There's a menu which is, represents you being awake and then when you go into the dream sequence, that's you asleep. There is an end game and there's an end cutscene, but you have to play the game for like 365 in-game days to get it. <laughs> and it doesn't, I mean, it just kind of loops back after and you can probably just watch it online if you really want to. Um, and I really like this game because first of all, like it's for a procedural game, for an early procedural game, it's really surreal, it's really disturbing. It seems to have no real formal like design orientation towards proceduralism, but it seems to be using it more to create really discombobulating spaces. Dreams that are fun or carnivalesque or even nightmarish sometimes. And it's an example of a next gen console game, which is more about exploring space and, ex and the expressivity of that space and architecture rather than a vehicle for like goal-oriented er entertainment and like using the next-gen tech towards that end. Um, so yeah, this is a bit outside of the period that I was kind of talking about. Um, but I think it's still kind of worth talking about just in terms of to, to show that even now when major franchises and you know, major consoles were starting to come out and sort of dominate the market, there were still people doing these experiments, even if they did ultimately end up leaving. So, what do these three people actually have in common? Well, not much. <laughs> but that's kind of the point. Like, that's why I chose them, because they're all so distinct. Um, there's something about, I find, uh, the indie darling-ish games. Not that they're bad, because some of them are very, very good. But I find they tend to be kind of samey. No, it's um, a first-person 3D walking simulator game with a narrative. and. It's trying really hard to make you cry, and <laughs> et cetera. And these games really don't have that much in common aesthetically, formally, or conceptually. And that's kind of awesome that they were all allowed to exist and be published around this period of time, right? Um, 
very little about the these people actually relates, except for the fact that they were using games as a way of presenting the human condition. Um, and they had their own sort of uh, impressions in terms of authorship of, you know, dealing with conceptual or thematic or aesthetic preoccupations in their own way. And so this whole idea of art versus games, thank you, Roger Ebert, for stoking the flames. I don't hate him too much for that, but the whole argument there is utterly a sham, right? It's always been a sham. Um, and I don't think it's a question of art versus games. I think it's a question of games versus commerce, which is part of a larger umbrella of art versus commerce, which has been going on literally forever. So of course we're not immune to it. And it raises a lot of questions about who is allowed to be a legitimate game designer. Only a handful of the, the people that I was talking about from this era are still actively making games. Uh, in, in terms of the people who seem to have left or seem to have kind of quieted down or faded into obscurity, we have Keita Takahashi, Katamari Damacy, um, Michael Berlin and Rebecca Heinemann, Test Times and Tone Town, Ed Annunziata, Echo the Dolphin, or Koichi Mori from Cosmology of Kyoto. A lot of these people end up leaving games and doing something else. And it's because I think the history of all hitherto existing video games is a history of class struggle. And we don't do a very good job of recognizing the people who actually make the games that we consume, especially when they don't fit into preconceived notions of what a developer is supposed to be. But we tend to forget that the field is historically diverse. Um, so we have a lot of these game auteurs beyond like Hideo Kojima, right? Um, so we have independent games. This is a picture of a BBS door, which was really just like the itch.io or a glorious train wrecks of yesteryear, which was really just full of all kinds of weird stuff. Um, published games like A Mind Forever Voyaging, like I said, Task Times and Tone Town. Um, so not only did these weird intimate games exist, but were arguably, they had a lot more leeway in terms of being avant-garde or personal or experimental because it was easier to kind of just throw experiments at a wall and see what stuck. It isn't because the industry ever really legitimately cared about these things, but it was easier to justify because the <laughs> kind of uh, closing in around certain reproducible and reliable ideas didn't really exist until starting around 1997. So, are we gonna go? Okay, so a note on author versus auteur. I really wanna make this really, 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 really clear. So the title of my talk is a bit of a trap, and this is gonna be really Anglo-centric, by the way. So it's, I'm sorry, but. Um, so obviously the word author and the word auteur mean exactly the same thing functionally. They, there's no real difference in terms of definition, but when you say auteur, at least in English, it has a certain specific connotation that harkens back to film theory. So Francois Truffaut didn't actually invent auteur theory, but he did expound on it a lot. Um, one of the most famous pieces for that is called A Certain Tendency of the French Cinema, um, where he talks about auteurs who are you know, often writing their own dialogue and in some cases think of the stories they direct. And basically what he's doing here is he's talking about auteurs who are directors and directorship as being like the captain of the helm when it comes to making a film. And he start like the whole piece is him basically castigating screenwriters for being inadequate directors. Um, and it's kind of, we kind of still do that. like. The effects of auteur theory are still around because we still tend to think of films in terms of who directed them and not in terms of this was made by a group of people. We think of the guy who is, you know, the, and we do this with games too, like whoever designed or directed a game tends to be the rock star and then everybody else is kind of just the low level functionary. Despite the fact that these processes, they are industrial processes, but they're also collaborative processes. Um, the late great critic, Pauline Kael, very cheekily um, kind of talked back at auteur theory. And she snapped back with this line, auteur theory is an attempt by adult males to justify staying inside the small range of experience of their boyhood and adolescence, that period when masculinity looks so great 
and important. <coughs> so we can kind of transpose this back onto games a little bit in terms of when we elevate a certain canon of acceptable auteurs that give us artistic legitimacy in games, we're saying this is the range of experience in games that is allowed to be considered artistic. And anything outside of that which doesn't fit cannot be considered. It, sometimes it isn't even considered a game. So we risk elevating some at the expense of others. It's sort of this neoliberal thing of plucking out certain artists and saying, here, we're legitimate now. Um, and so the, the examples of the, the figures that I mentioned were meant to be kind of instructive of, oh, these people existed, but not definitive. There are a lot of other people behind them who are helping them make the things that they made. Um, so I think that the reclamation of art history when we're talking about art history should be collective rather than individual and to try to be as comprehensive as possible. So is it possible to recuperate this history? So as I said, that tech progressivism and that corporate self-interest and perpetually young labor force, these are sort of certain conditions that make it really, really hard to reclaim anything. Because when people burn out at 25, and then the people coming in are like 19, what can they possibly remember? And since the industry doesn't do very much to arca uh, archive or curate anything, it's really, really hard to go back and build up that history if you're a younger person. Like, I'm piecing things together basically piecemeal right now and picking arbitrary dates, basically. Um, so the people who make these games are, as I said, often pushed into the margins, sometimes figuratively, sometimes literally. Um, in terms of, you know, we have like, here's a category in our online store of weird games that you might not have heard of. And it's like this little tiny category off the side somewhere. Um, you have things like the ESA claiming all hacking illegal, even in the cases of abandoned games that are no longer supported. You have people, like at Konami, you have, you know, the pulling of the Silent Hill demo and making it, you know, unable to re-download it despite critical acclaim and popular acclaim for their own personal and business-minded reasons. So there's no in incentive if there's no profit incentive to do these things. So we have to do them all ourselves. It means that even I have huge holes in my historical knowledge. But I think it can be remedied in a few ways. So we can shift our values, I think, in terms of critical and intellectual and curative values. Some of that stuff is much broader socially in terms of collective action and social reform. So I think things like universal minimum income, it just makes it easier to make the art you want to make anyway because <laughs> you're not afraid of starving. Um, having intersectional unions, especially at the AAA level, so that the people who are making games aren't being exploited to death. Um, you having uh, robust labor reporting, having uh, labor-facing models of creation and distribution because Consumers of games are profoundly alienated from the process of making them. It's as if they grow off trees, and it has to be exactly as expected. Um, and so having that, having state arts funding, trust and grants in local communities um, can really, really help. They, there are dangers in those things too, but overwhelmingly, I think they can be a really positive force um, towards reclaiming this history and towards um, getting ourselves to a point where we recognize this legacy and so we aren't constantly retreading old ground and making claims of newness when they don't actually hold true with reality. So is it possible? Yes, it is. Um, I like to end on a good note. Uh, so there are a few examples, at least from the curative and critical level, that are doing a lot of really important work right now. Some of those are, like, this is all... Um, critical stuff. So this is like Zeal, a Haywire magazine, Arcade Review, which I write for, full disclosure. Um, there are distribution sites like Warp Door and Glorious Trainwrecks. There are abandoned wear sites like Appendonia. Uh, there are Door BBS sites. There's abandoned wear. My abandoned wear is a really good one. Itch.io, which is like the Steam alternative if you want a game to sell, but it's too weird for Steam and you don't want to deal with the comments, so you can go to Itch.io. Um, there are dev collect collectives, like things like Baby Castles or Kokoromi, but even smaller local ones can at times be really, really valuable in terms of creating collaborative and cooperative workspaces for people and teaching people how to make games, how to distribute games, how to even talk about games. Um, there are art journals and magazines that are interested in reaching out but don't know who to talk to, like Rhizome, which is why we have to go to them. <laughs> 
Um, so, you know, if you want to like pitch at hyperallergic or something, do it. <laughs> What's the worst that can happen? Um, and then you get out, you, you start building those bridges with the art community and getting these things out to a bigger audience who might be more receptive to the ideas in them. Um, and there's a very, very small but growing labor movement in games towards things like unionization and collective bargaining and things like that. And there are a lot of these uh, local art collectives uh, and game development collectives often talk about these things. So if you want to get involved like in your local development community with people who are thinking about these things, that's a really valuable way of gra like grassroots collective action that you can actually do. So um, that's pretty much it. Uh, <laughs> Um, so spaces like this, as I said, are really, really valuable. Spaces exactly like this, by the way, who are getting all these people involved in talking about these things and actually valuing and centering them. If you happen to enjoy this, <laughs> then you can follow me on Twitter at Mechapoetic. You can, my website is Sufficiently Human, I, I run that. And uh, if you maybe <coughs> even want to give me some money, uh, my Patreon is, you know, just my name. So that's it, and thank you for listening. Can I just grab this and go? Yeah. Unless anyone's got any quick questions? No? No? No. Good. Well,